¿Ya tomaron café? Sí. ¿No hay café? Uy, hay una señora por ahí, there is a lady that is gonna kill me because I promised her that today we were going to have coffee. Last year we have some problems, but uh, we're gonna do something, I'm sorry. So I am very happy to be in Richmond because I live in Portland. Every time that I come here, I can practice Spanish, you know. 40% of Richmond residents are, speak Spanish. And, and I am very happy to be here also because it's very diverse and it's a very progressive city. And we decided to start the Soil Not All conference here in Richmond as a political statement against Chevron, you know? <laughs> and because we really admire what people have been doing here organizing. And I think there will be tomorrow some, some presentations about how Richmond changed the politics. And one of the main people behind was the current mayor, Tom Booth, that I would like to invite him to come here. And he's also actually a, a urban farmer. How many of you grow food? So I think he, he has a lot in common with you. Tom, can you please join us? <laughs> so I'm gonna let you with him. He's amazing. And he has been defeating Chevron for many years here in this town. Thanks so much. Welcome to Richmond, everyone. Thank you. Our recently completed marketing and branding study came up with the strap line, Bayfront, Homefront, Outfront. Hosting this soil, not oil conference for three years, for the past three years, is an example of what we mean by out front. Being out front is not always easy. Two years ago, we totally banned chemical herbicide use by city crews on city properties. <laughs> including street edges and medians. Unfortunately, weeds have taken over many of our streets, and our city crews blame the chemical ban. They tell us that we've taken, taken away uh, the only tool they can afford to use to control weeds. They've not yet learned how to cope without chemicals, but we will get there, and maybe we'll learn some things at this conference that'll help us get there. Richmond is out front in many areas that utilize sustainable practices consistent with the soil, not oil movement. We collect food waste from both residential and commercial customers. We combine it with veg vegetative waste, compost it, and sell it to both farmers and residential users. We encourage sustainable urban agriculture by supporting organizations like Urban Tilt. The city of Richmond buildings, including the one you're in now, use 100% renewable electrical energy. Our health and all policies ordinance requires all city policies to make Richmond a healthier place. And it states to achieve health equity, Richmond focuses on the social de determinants of health. This refers to the conditions in the environment where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and eventually age. And good health is fundamental for a strong economy and a vibrant society. And health outcomes are largely dependent on the social determinants of health. When we have healthy land and soil, we have a healthier community. This conference is an opportunity not just to learn, but to seek partnerships that work on our efforts that prioritize collaboration before conflict. Soil Not Oil is an excellent opportunity to celebrate our collective leadership and demonstrate the best visions to heal the earth. Thank you for joining us in Richmond and I hope you have a very successful conference, learn a lot, meet a lot of other people you can work with, 
and take these things home to where you came from and put them to work. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Butt, and appreciate uh, your, your leadership uh, uh, on these important environmental issues. <clears throat> so thanks again for everybody for, uh, for coming to, uh, to the event uh, today. So it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our next um, speaker, our keynote speaker, Ray Archuleta. Um, Ray is a, a farmer from uh, Missouri. He also is a 31-year uh, veteran uh, at NRCS, the National Resource Conservation District, um, and he's recently re retired. Uh, I've gotten to know Ray. Uh, Ray is a real leader in the whole movement around healthy soils, and he's been a student of the healthy soils. Um, he has also has recently formed a, a consulting group with Gabe Brown and several other people working with large uh, farmers in the Midwest, teaching them about soils. He's also one of the stars in the Kiss the Ground film. And Ray's been a real inspiration for people about how we can connect with nature through farming. Uh, and so uh, want to give it, let's give it up for Ray. And, and he's been a very busy guy. I'm glad he's coming out here today. Does it work? All right. All right, my little PowerPoint thing. Thank you. Okay, folks. Man, isn't that movie awesome? Yeah. That is exciting. Let's start off this way. I'm going to say, good morning. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. I always start that when I go do a, a talk all over the country, and that really gets me excited about it. Folks, how did we get here? It, let me tell you how. We started years ago, oh, about 10 or 12 years ago, and John, thank you again for inviting me here. I really appreciate it. About 12 years ago, if you would have typed the word soil health on a Google, maybe get a couple hundred, maybe a thousand. Ladies and gentlemen, now you do a Google search on just the word soil health, 52,400,000. There's 925,000 soil health videos on YouTube with the word soil health and then 4,000, 4 million pieces of literature out there. So how did this movement start for me and for several others? It started this way, ladies and gentlemen, one word. Failure. I was failing. I was not able to help my producers. I was not able to help them stop this on their farms. I was failing in helping them bring their sons and daughters into the operation. Ladies and gentlemen, that picture was taken in 2016, April. Do you see all the college degrees, all the replicated research, all the conservation planning? Look at it, blowing in our beautiful country. That's still happening after 85 years. Look at this, ladies and gentlemen. This is Iowa 2017. This is still happening in our precious country. Let's go look a couple of years back, Colorado. I said this in front of a large group at the Organic Conference in PASA, 1935. Look at the soil. Ladies and gentlemen, most of our agriculture has destroyed our planet was mostly overgrazing and tillage. There was no chemicals. It was done under an organic system. I told my organic farmers, I said, organic farmers, it's not about organic. It's above organic. It's regenerative. Please keep in mind, thank you, because see, we got to understand, tillage is incredibly destructive. We didn't know that. I didn't know that. Let's continue this down this journey. So keep in mind, it's not about organic. It's much more, de it's deeper than that. Ladies and gentlemen, oops. Okay. Slides, did I get stuck? Computer error, don't you just love them? You, do you need to start it again?
Okay. Stop clicking. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to show you the next slide. It's going to show you that in an area of Arkansas, we get 60 inches of rain. 60 inches of rain and farmers are still irrigating. Wrap that around your mind. 60 inches of rain and they're still irrigating. That is mind boggling to me. There it is. This is Arkansas. 60 inches of rain. They are land leveling for flood irrigation and the USDA, I used to work for USDA, are still paying for these destructive practices because the soil is so dysfunctional. As I go all over the country, this slide kick, got me kicked out of, of a certain state by our own NRCS employee, said he did not like it because I said our lakes and rivers are filled with conservation and nutrient management plants. <laughs> and not crystal clear with understanding. I have wrote plans that solved nothing. It's not, is planning important? Absolutely. It's not the goal. Ladies and gentlemen, I grew up in New Mexico. This is what I grew up seeing. I went to school in Las Cruces, New Mexico, New Mexico State. Dr. Johnson's here, he teaches there. I wish I would have had him as a professor. This is what I grew up seeing. I was born in 1961, and I didn't realize my state was a short, steep prairie. I grew up there. Our family's been there for 500 years. This is what you see when you go to New Mexico. This is what it, this is what it once was. Ladies and gentlemen, if you think about all the, the prairie land and the grassland that's bare, think about the soil temperatures that are increasing all over the globe. We have focused so much on CO2. It's not just CO2. It's the heat that that sun hits that bare soil, reflecting this huge amounts of energy off and pushing the rain clouds away. CO2 is just one aspect. It's much more complex than that. The white shows temperatures over 150 degrees. Look at this whole continent. This used to be grassland. This used to be a forest. So I make it personal. This slide I like to show is that the soil is naked, hungry, thirsty, running a fever. It's this bare ground in millions and millions of acres in our range and our cropland. If we want to do one simple thing, if we can get producers just to cover the land, to put a living plant at the end of the year, if we can restore our range and bring living plants to regulate the temperature, it would make a huge difference. So what got me here? I can't, as the more you ponder, I started realizing, my goodness, after the last couple of years, I had this aha moment. I was a product, and I am a product of reductionist science. I didn't realize going through eight years of university, I was taught reductionist science. Now, reductionist science is very, very powerful. In fact, we couldn't get to the moon, we could not fly without reductionist science. It is powerful. But it does not work for human health, and it does not work for natural living systems. That's why I started promoting Dr. Russell Acoff, systems thinking, write him down, watch his one hour and a half video so you can learn how to think in systems because you are a system. I am a system. We're a complex system. I started realizing it wasn't just me, but modern agriculture and our producers were taught reductionism. Reductionism is where you study the little piece, but you forget that the little pieces are connected to a whole. I sit there and tell my farmer audience, I said, farmers, what is this? I said, raise your hand when you think that is a car. Some people will raise their hand, but how many believe that is pieces of a car? And some raise their hand. I said, ladies and gentlemen, that is pieces of a car. See, if I jump on that tire, I said, tire, get me to Walmart. It would not get me to Walmart. If I jump on the engine, engine, get me to Walmart. It will not do it. Yeah, or get me to Whole Food. No. Oh, get me to the organic conference. Yeah, yeah there we go. I said, get me there. It would not get me there, would it? 
It's the collective pieces work as a whole. What have we done in our universities? Plant pathology, entomology, agronomy, soils. We put them in distinct pieces. They should be all together. What have we done in our medical field? When you go to a doctor, you go to the generalist and you'll say, oh, you got a problem with your stomach. We're gonna send you to the stomach person. We're gonna send you to the liver person. No, the first doctor should be the most brilliant and knows the collective whole working together. We need holistic science. Let me give you an example here. This is how we've been implementing for 85 years conservation on the land. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a picture of what NRCS, USDA, a lot of us, and I don't put a blame, it's, it's, it, it just happened. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the riparian corridor. These are the filter strips. These are all grass waterways. Look at the system, the soil, when it's no-till. Look at all the aggregation. Look at a till system. You destroy the aggregation. Destroyed aggregation. So a majority of our farms are still heavily tilled. The only functioning part of that soil is where the filter strips the riparian corridors and the grass waterways are there. That's where the soils are functioning. So when you go to the office, we give prescriptions. We give diaper practices. See, a majority of the surface of the soil is still uncovered and is still heavily tilled. So the only spots working, functioning to optimum is where the diapers are at. Now, am I a big, do, I, do we need diapers? Yes, we do. Let me give an example. If, if I get a bug and I put it in my hand and I get this little bug and I smack it and I kill it, what does it die of, audience? Lack of space. <laughs> Nature needs space also. We need those buffers. We need those corridors. But let's make the whole system a buffer. Can you imagine we covered the whole land? Let me go back here. Ladies and gentlemen, let me show you the old science. This is the old science. There's science to back this up. We have been doing this for years. This is the new science. This is intrusive. This is collaborative. This works with nature. We are no-tilling corn and soybean into a living cover. We're doing it on thousands of acres, ladies and gentlemen. Do you see the distinct difference? This is agroecology in practice. It's so exciting. And we're cutting our herbicides by 80%. No more fungicides, no more insecticides, reduction in chemi chemistry. And there are no tillers. Oh yeah, they use that wicked herbicide. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to be careful how we communicate. Look at the new old science. Remember, a lot of our farmers were taught the old science. We taught them, I taught them, I was taught that way. Look at the new science. Get a little toy car and, let, and move your cattle around. Let the cows express their cowness, in the words of Joe Salatin. This is the old science. This is the new science. This is collaborative. This is reductionist. This is mechanicistic. This shows the system alive. Look at that, isn't that amazing? There's life in it. Why? Why do we go through such a mechanized, reductionist type of agriculture? Ladies and gentlemen, 200 years ago, 80% of the people farmed. They farmed. We only have one to 2% of the people that are producing huge amounts of food. That's why we use so much chemistry. Who is going to pick the weeds? How many of, so we have a displacement of population. 
I, I go to a bunch of producers. They don't like to use the chemistry. It costs money. It's expensive. They're going broke. Our agriculture is run on ancient sunlight. Pesticides, fertilizers, we got here. We all drove here with ancient sunlight, a precious resource. I tell my producers, I know where you're at. If your farm and ranch is working predominantly on ancient sunlight versus new sunlight, you're not flowing with nature. Ladies and gentlemen, this was taking a picture in Illinois. Most of our ground is bare in the winter. We want to cover our soils with these primers all over the country. We want to capture sun all the time. In the winter, we want to have covers. One of the things that really resonated with me a long time ago, I was one night, I finally realized, I come out of my ha uh, bedroom and I tell my wife and I'm all excited, I said, wife, the plant and soil are one. She looked at me and she goes, boy, you are so disturbed. <laughs> she goes, no, hon, it, they're one. See, we were never taught they're one unit. If I take the plant out and if I take the soil biology out, what do we have? Geology. You have geology. What we're teaching farmers now, here's his living root exuding liquid sun. Our job is pretty simple is to put as much liquid sun into the soil to feed the microorganisms. More cycling, less fertility that I have to buy. Less dependency on ancient sunlight. That's what we're teaching producers. We use, what do we use? We use the slate test. And I'm, I'm not gonna go through that real quick because most of you have seen the slate test. How many of you seen the slate test? Most of you have not. Oh my God. Well, maybe we'll go through it real quick. This is how we get to farmers. How do I get into the door with a farmer? Is this one test. Both of them work very effectively. Here we go. This is how I start off. You got a video with that? Audio? I have a question to ask you. Is, your is that it? Healthy, functioning, and stable. Well, we use that one, one test. You can watch it on YouTube. Tools that I know of is the soil stability test. Here are two soils, exactly the same soil type. This soil has been tilled for 30 years. This soil has not been tilled for 40 years. It is covered with diverse plants year round. Watch what happens when we drop the soil in the water. Notice how the conventional till soil is falling apart. The biotic glues in the organic litter are burned up by tillage. The soil pores have collapsed. Notice the no-till soil. The pore spaces are still intact. Do this test for yourself. I guarantee if you dig a little, you'll learn a lot. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that test, I have seen a farmer convert 30,000 acres with just watching that demonstration into no-tilling covers. One test. The soil is incredibly articulate. Here's the other test. See, because you gotta remember, I only got one or two mini minutes with an with a audience of farmers. One to two minutes. Here's the other to test. To fully appreciate the, the potential test. runoff and erosion from a conventionally tilled field like this, you really need to be out here during the most intense thunderstorm of the year. Since most people aren't willing to do that, here in Virginia, we use a rainfall simulator to help our farmers. This is probably one of the most powerful test demonstrations really we use to teach. These things cost about three to five thousand dollars. Everybody should have one. On the left, we start with a tray of dry, loose soil taken from a clean till field. On the right, we start with a slice of intact surface soil from a long-term no-till field. This soil is not only protected with a mulch of cover crop residue, it also has a stable porous sponge structure. You know, years ago as a kid, I remember, you know, you'd get these, these big heavy thunderstorms in the summer and it would just, it would just wash the field and you'd end up with, with mud down on the road. And I'm talking about mud that you'd go over there with a the skid loader and scoop out of the way so the cars could go down the road. 
what I'm seeing now is I'm seeing these heavy rainfalls and I'm barely seeing a trickle coming out of the field. After we simulate an extremely intense thunderstorm for five minutes, the differences are obvious. Most of the water we apply to this soil has run off into this jar, carrying away with it a thin but very significant layer of topsoil. We just applied an inch and a half of very intense rainfall to this bare, tilled soil. This happens in an organic system also. Obviously, we harvested very little for future plant use. Meanwhile, this no-till soil has absorbed virtually every drop of water we applied. What little ran off is clear. The bottom line is pretty simple. If you want to harvest more rain like these no-till farmers are doing, keep your soil covered on top and make it a sponge underneath. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what we're teaching farmers now, even our organic brothers and sisters, reduce your physical and your chemical disturbances. Reduce them. Tillage is intrusive. How does tillage destroy the soil? You wake up bacteria and they eat the biotic glues and make the pores collapse. We've known that since the 30s. Ladies and gentlemen, let's back up here. See, in college, they told me the physical, the chemical, and biology of the soil and the organic matter, they're all equal importance. That's what I was taught. I say, no, that is wrong. Biology maintains the aggregates, builds the physical, regulates the chemistry through organic matter. Biology reigns. It rains, ladies and gentlemen. Look at this. It's this elegant system. When we show farmers that your soil is alive, it starts to change the way they manage. See, they thought for a long time it was just a growing medium. After eight years of university study, I didn't realize how alive it is. That's what we're dealing with, ladies and gentlemen. Nice little water bear. How forceful, how wonderful, how powerful is life? How many of you have seen a picture like this? Raise your hand. I could never explain that. I said, can you know those trees are heavily arbiscular mycorrhizae fungi? They excrete these powerful enzymes that break the rock down. Bacteria break rock down. Life is powerful. And I tell farmers, I said, farmers, that's a compaction issue. And they all go, they start laughing and go, yeah. So what do they usually do to break compaction? Tillage. You know what the best way to break compaction? Life. Look how powerful it is. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a farm in Australia and a calcium sea carb, uh, carbonate seabed. And I asked the farmers, how is it black on the top? Life. It is powerful. Just to bring in the point about life, how many of you remember Chernobyl? Some of you weren't even born at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, remember they told us about Chernobyl? It was gonna be death. It was gonna be a desert. Nothing was ever gonna survive, remember that? People lost their lives. It's eight kilometers, killed everything biologically. People had to move, people lost their lives. Look at now. Ladies and gentlemen, we way underestimate the resilience of our planet. It is much, it is incredibly powerful. Ladies and gentlemen, our current agriculture, Chernobyl is a better location than our current agriculture. See, because Chernobyl doesn't allow humans there. It gives it rest. Our fields get plummet with tillage and fungicides and insecticides and herbicides, there is no rest for them. Chernobyl will recover quicker. So what are we doing now, ladies and gentlemen? We are bringing ecological memory back. 
We are planting multi-species uh, multi cover crops through the whole country on hundreds and thousands of acres. We're bringing ecological memory back. Gabe, my partner, my friend, my mentor, he said to me, Ray, I used to get up every morning to see what I had to kill. Now I get up every morning to see what I bring to life. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, he was a conventional farmer. He's not organic. He's regenerative. I was conventional too. Folks, biology is so powerful, we now found bugs. Humans have found bugs that eat plastic and eat styrofoam. That is so cool. That gives me hope. Now, what's the answer? Biomimicry. I think we should all wear t-shirts when I go to the airport and I said, man, I got, I do biomimicry. I'm a biomimicker. Well, what do you do? I farm and ranch. I mimic the template. This is what I love. Some of our best designs, ladies and gentlemen, come from the natural template itself. Velcro was designed by the Cockleburr. Great engineer. You know what the name of that engineer is? Millionaire. There's nothing wrong with that, ladies and gentlemen. Some of our best design. How many of you have an iPhone? Raise your hand. How many of you have a phone? Biomimicry. The antenna was designed by fractals. We're using elephant tusks. We're, we're mimicking the elephant trunks to do biomimicry. Biomimicry has been around for a long time, ladies and gentlemen. Our goal, like Janine Banius was saying, we want to mimic the prairie and the forest. That's what we're doing right now. You know why I missed it? My college education got in the way. Biomimicry is even in the ancient scriptures. Ask the beasts and they will teach you. We have lost the art of observation. I have lost the art of observation. Do you know how difficult it is to try to convey this in a conventional agriculture? You know what the first thing they tell me? Well, Ray, where is your data? That's the first thing they throw in my face. I said, really? How about these brilliant researchers? This is patterns and applications have, have been there for many, many years in nature, but they rarely applied. We are now designing our cover crop mixes to mimic the top of the the architecture of the prairie and the forest to capture energy. This is the way our mixes are looking. I hate the name cover crop. I wish we could find a better name. If you can find a better name, but I hate it. Cover crop only denote, denotes cover the soil. Cover crops are biological primers, energy transformers, nutrient sequesters. The ancients used to call the plant the mouth of the soil. If we can figure out a better name than cover crop, please let me know. Because I hate the current name. Now we are mimicking, we are doing the armor in the soil. We are planting green out of brown. The prairie has, when you pull the prairie grass in the bottom of the prairie grass, you'll see armor. Look how we're doing this on large scales of agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, what is that? When I did that, the organic group, they said, oh, that's a cancer machine. And they started laughing. I said, you know what that cancer machine does? It puts standing covers. It plants covers on standing corn. Look at that, ladies and gentlemen, on thousands. Farmers built that. And you should have seen the organic group get quiet. Look what we're doing in Manchester, Tennessee, on hundreds of thousands of acres. We are planting corn and soybean into standing cover. We are capturing sun to the last minute. We are capturing nutrients to the last minute. Isn't that beautiful? Yes, we're working towards that. We are working towards that. We are capturing sun, we're doing diversity. 
Do you see any weeds? Look at the cereal rye laying it down. Look at that beautiful cereal rye rolled. Are we increasing yields, reducing herbicide use? Look at on the corn. Look at the tobacco that was heavily tilled before. No till. People said, well, how long does it take, Ray? It's a function of you. It's a function of the producers. This young man, uh, Adam Daughtery, less than three years, they started with no-till. Look how no-till by itself looked. We knew no-till was not the answer by itself. Ecological farming. Once we put the covers into no-till, the increase of respiration in three years was 279%. The carbon, the food being used by those soils are incredible. Those soils are cycling so quickly. Our soil health scores have improved by 50% in less than two to three years. We are now mimicking buffalo. We are running our animals biomimicry. Look how we're doing with them. We are running the animals so tight so that we have urine and manure distribution to feed the microbes. Most people that fight against cows do not understand how the soil works. We need large herbivores. They need to impact the soil. This is why our range are becoming deserts, because we don't run it through biomimicry. Look how Gabe Brown's, how we're grazing the cows tight together, like buffalo. We are now using a bat latch, battery power operated uh, bat latch, has a timer, releases the bungee cord, the cows move by themselves. Look how we've changed the soil by just properly grazing from one to eight inches. Well, we're going to wrap it up here. I'm going to show you the last couple of slides, and it gave me so much hope. Please uh, type in West Texas Circle Ranch by Christopher Gill. I grew up in New Mexico in a very brittle environment. This is what we see through the whole country, ladies and gentlemen. We see bare soils. And our scientists said, you can't have plants growing there because these shrubs are aliopathic. And I would drive through my state and I said, how are we going to regenerate that soil? Ladies and gentlemen, look how the bareness of that soil. On millions and millions of acres. Now look what happens when you have an ecological focused producer. Look what happened. He went in with a a limited tillage just to disturb the soil, not too much. Key line plow. Did it on a slope on topography. And look what happened using mob grazing. He brings in the cattle like, like buffalo. And look what happened and brought ecological memory back. Ladies and gentlemen, we can do this. Gives me a lot of hope. So I, le I, I leave you with this last note. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to do the most, to me, the most important thing that we have to do to push this movement. One word. Love your neighbor. Be careful how we communicate with them because we don't know where they're at. See, the moment what we do as humans, we put distinct differences. Let's work on our commonalities. We all have the same thing in goal. We have to support our family. We have to feed them. You've got to understand the pressures of poor farmers. Farmers right now, according to the Center of Disease, have the highest suicide rate of the top 30 careers, farmers and ranchers. They have a huge burden of maintaining the infrastructure. But if we do this in love and communicate and understand their context, we put society as a whole put them there. We taught them there. The university, NRCS, the government, we did this. Now we have to work our way out. So ladies and gentlemen, let's promote our brotherly love to help our producers to understand their context. I want to thank you for having me, John. I think this is the way we're going to promote it. Thank you.
Is anyone else inspired? Hello, my fellow soil enthusiasts, environmentalists, movers, shakers, change makers, parents, children, human beings. My name is Erin Schrode. I am a proud citizen activist and the co-founder of Turning Green, a nonprofit around environmental education and advocacy that I had the privilege to co-found here in the Bay Area about 12 years ago. We champion all of these regenerative practices. We've launched a school lunch program that is 100% fresh, local, organic, seasonal, non-GMO. It's scratch cook food. We piloted in Marin City and we just ran a successful pilot right here in Richmond last year that will be going into West Contra Costa County. It's my honor to be here with you today. I'll be somewhat of your guide throughout the rest of the afternoon. Programs will be arriving soon, but if you have questions in the interim, there are volunteers all around, so come and talk to us. When I speak about environmentalism with young people, with all people, about climate change, about conservation, about solutions, about eco-education, about healthy living, I now have a solution to put forth. Soil. Soil is the new bottom line. This is what we are talking about as we move forward when we think about how this affects us all, regenerative agriculture, drawdown, agroecology, cultivating new farmers, holistic science. We're talking about solutions, about a paradigm shift within reach. So today, we think about how these issues of environmentalism affect our global family. We send out prayers to those being affected by extreme weather events right now, at this very moment, and we double down on our commitment to talk about the realities of climate change and to talk about the solutions we put forth here at Soil Not Oil. It is now my privilege to invite to the stage a man that I have known for many years on the steering committee of Soil Not Oil, the founder of Nutiva, a company proudly based right here in Richmond that has planted tr fruit trees in all of the schools to talk about regenerative agricultural solutions to climate change. So I now give you John Rulak. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, is this, can you hear me okay? Um, can we get the, how about there? Is that good? Great, excellent. And um, also my fellow panelists are joining us here. Um, Tim LaSalle and Gregory Lando. Okay, can you, uh, so uh, as many of, of you might be aware, I've been focused on environmental solutions um, since I've been a young man and been really uh, interested in the role of, of agriculture and climate over the last four or five years focusing on that. But in the last year and a half, it came to me that one of the big issues that's not really discussed in the agricultural and climate change movement is the oceans. And where do you think all that carbon that's from the poor tillage practices, where do you think all that carbon from burning oil here at, at, at the Chevron facility or Exxon or all different places, where do you think that carbon ends up when it's in the atmosphere? Where do you think it goes sometimes? In the oceans. So we're gonna talk about the oceans in peril and what we, what we can do to save them and to me, the number one environmental issue in the world today, if we don't resolve in the next few years, it's, is the oceans. And it's all, it's all connected. How many people know this, uh, this visionary uh, scientist and uh, designer here? Bucky Fuller. Let's, yeah, let's give it up for Bucky. He's a great, great person. We can learn a lot. This is a, this is a great quote. Technology evolved by man is amateurish compared to the elegance of non-humanly contrived regeneration. He was onto that word a little earlier, huh? 
Man does not recognize technology other than his own, so he speaks of the rest as something he ignorantly calls nature. Think about that. How many people have seen this book uh, by Paul Hawk and Drawdown? Really encourage you. It lists 100 of the top solutions for climate change. And interestingly, one of the top solutions right up there uh, is actually uh, if you combine women's education and young girls' education, it's the number one solution to climate change. Um, and also interestingly, because they make better decisions, 15 of the top 25 solutions to climate change is uh, land-based. So uh, there's a lot of things we can do with soil. But we're going to talk a little about, about oceans. And at the breakout session, we're going to do an hour and a half breakout session, the Bermuda Room uh, at 1130, or probably maybe we're running a little late, maybe 1145. Uh, and we're going to focus on some of this oceans in greater, greater depth and how we're going to regenerate some of the coastline here in California with our kelp forests. Uh, and Aaron from Lift Economy and Dan Marquez uh, from uh, as a a good friend of mine from Santa Barbara who has the 25 acre lease to start uh, farming uh, kelp, giant kelp uh, in Santa Barbara, but he's got a few little hurdles in front of him on it, but he's, he's, he's gonna be joining us. This is potentially California's next billion dollar regenerative crop, and the idea is, is that we can, re we can reforest, regrow the oceans. I know this seems like a strange concept, and uh, we're going to talk a little about that today and, and, and why, that's, why that's important. Right today, there's over 12 million uh, tons of seaweed that's harvested on an annual basis on the globe, and most of that's in China. It's a $5 billion market. Um, how many people have heard of maxi crop, if you're a farmer? We're, we're using maxi crop, and it's imported from Norway. What about if we could create a uh, harvest from the ocean with no pesticides, no fertilizers, not eating any fresh water, and harvest that and, and do that right here in California or on the West Coast? And giant kelp is a keystone species here along the coast, and it's really having some significant challenges. But it, it supports the aquatic life, hundreds of... of, of um, aquatic life from, I was recently uh, in the San Juan Islands in Washington State uh, near, near Canada and, and noticed a, a spider crab that was crawling up the, the kelp forest there. Um, there's a great video called A Forest of the Sea. If you really want to learn about the importance of kelp, uh, on our co uh, I encourage you to uh, go to YouTube, A Forest of the Sea. It was done in, the 1980, in 1983. It was a time capsule of what our kelp forest used to look like. And we're going to get into about some of the challenges them. This is, we're going to, I'm going to, unfortunately, I'm going to share some, some, some not so good news about our oceans. Our oceans are in trouble, serious trouble. We live on an ocean planet, not a land planet. Though we're so land-centric, we, we tend to, to focus on the land. Here's a, a collapse of the sardine population you can see. And and it all starts with the plankton, and then the fish, and, and then the, the, the sea pups. Many of them have been starving because they don't have the food here on the California coast. This is a, 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 a campaign I haven't launched quite yet, but it talks about climate change is real, and, and these dying plankton, the dead coral reefs, but these characters here believe that climate change is a hoax, and unfortunately, they're influencing a lot of people. I call them the dead, dead Ocean Society. In the Indian Ocean, over 30% of the plankton has died. And this was from a report, a German scientific agency. This was over 10 years ago. And the phytoplankton are the basis for the ocean health. This is where the life begins in the ocean. If you walked in the high-tech Silicon Valley today down the corridors of Facebook or Google and you asked them, well, where do you, where's your oxygen being produced? Do you think they would, do you think, many people don't know. They, it's like some factories producing it. But it's the ocean produces two-thirds of our oxygen. And our food system is literally destroying our oxygen system by putting so much carbon absorbing in, into that. 
Luckily, we have an app for that, and we learned that from, from Ray's presentation, what we know. Regenerative agriculture can return that carbon that's really, it's really a food producing, water conserving asset. And by, by doing that, we can pull that carbon from the ocean and put it back into the soils. And the oceans are warming at a very rapid rate. And that's one of the issues, it's absorbing the, the, the heat. Over 90% of the excess heat and 30% of the CO2. In the last 50 to 100 years, it, the, the pH, the acidity has increased by 30%. And when you do tests and you take the phytoplankton and you put it and you increase the acidification of what we're gonna see in the next 20, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, the shells in the phytoplankton, what, what do you think happens to them? They just dissolve. So either we put, the so we put the carbon back into the soil and start to restore the oceans, or 90% of all species, in my view, by 2040 or 2015, and of course you don't hear the scientists say this so much, will be gone, 90% of all species on the planet. I'm so sick and tired of the climate movements, like the, uh, the sea level will rise three feet by 2100. That that's the, seems to be the punchline for all these you know, articles. We won't even be around to be measuring 2100 if we don't deal with the carbon now. Thank you. Marine permaculture, and we're gonna, for folks who wanna come to our session, we'll get into some more of the detail. It can tap in to create thriving ecosystems, has the ability to transform vast ocean areas. We can grow, there's two types of systems. You can grow it way out into the oceans, and we can also grow it close to the coastline, which, um, and growing, growing native species of, of seaweeds and kelps. You can power it by ocean thermal energy to upwell to bring down some of the colder, more nutrient-dense water up to the surface. There's a project in Australia right now that's, been, uh, that's being funded by Australian government that's gonna go live next year on a 10, foot, 10 meter by 30, uh, 30 meter platform, 70 feet below the surface of the ocean to grow some of these, uh, these uh, native uh, seaweeds. And no inputs are needed, and it creates blue and green uh, business jobs. So if you came across this mountain, and let's just say you were the person who was in charge of this, of this area, this mountain, what would you, what would you do? Would you place a fence around it and prevent the humans in and just say, we're gonna preserve this area here, we're gonna keep the humans out, and, and we're, not gonna, we're, not gonna, we're just gonna let nature restore it? Or would you reforest it by planting native species? The vision of people who are involved in, in this ocean restorative farming movement and I've only been involved in this for this last year, and we've been, we've been having a series of meetings here in California, uh, working with Lift Economy and other folks who've helped organize, and we have one coming up in San Francisco, it's an invite only, uh, you know, with people who are practitioners and scientists, and Bren Smith, you might have heard of Bren Smith from uh, Rhode Island, he was a keynote speaker at Bioneers, is that we can reforest the oceans, and the ocean movement, a lot of the oceans uh, folks are, their ideas is to, do marine protection zones, but when you br when you regrow the kelp and some of these things, you attract it's attracted to the habitat. So, um, and it can also sequester carbon and has the potential to replace carbon cent centric materials such uh, as uh, animal feed, uh, energy, fertilizers, uh, and also cosmetics and, and food. It's uh, it's still very early stages. There's a lot of questions, what would be the market, how are we gonna process it, how are we gonna permit it, um, and we'll be getting a little more in the Bermuda room. Uh, but it's, it's another way to using uh, permaculture and ecological design to uh, help restore the oceans uh, and uh, be part of that solution. Um, so um, look forward to uh, people learning more about that. Um, and I'm, I wanna go ahead and introduce our, our next speaker, um, uh, Tim LaSalle, I've known Tim over the last couple of years. Uh, Tim uh, is a farmer in Atascadero. Uh, he's also a professor emeritus uh, at um, UC San Luis Obispo. He's been involved, he was also uh, 
uh, executive director, CEO at uh, Rodale Institute. He's had a long history in, in agriculture, both uh, conventional and then moving over to the regenerative agriculture model. And he's also working with people including Rosie Burroughs, um, one of our supporters and friends here, a farmer. Um, from Central California on a new model at Chico State uh, around regenerative agriculture with a new research uh, uh, center at the, at the university. So uh, really glad uh, uh, Tim would make it. Let's give it up for uh, Tim LaSalle. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. It's a delight to be here and good morning to you. And John has been a great leader uh, from a consciousness standpoint about how we restore. And he understands the deep linkage between soil and ocean. And we understand that by God, if we don't get this carbon back in the soil, the oceans die, we die, and it continues. And so the soils are such a focus for all of us as we move forward. Ray Archuleta um, is right on. And Ray, you and I spent the early part of our careers teaching lies because that's the way we were trained. And we taught industrialized, uh, intensive agriculture. And I was a full professor tenured at Cal Poly. But what I saw globally were major, major issues that we weren't addressing, nor could the science we were promulgating really address it. So when I looked at what were, I saw globally in traveling, the four major issues that were happening upon civilization was the climate threat, continued hunger challenges, which there are huge famines in Africa right now, a water challenge globally, and we in California certainly understand that, and a soil loss. We have 60 harvests left on this planet. 60. And Ray showed you the pictures of where our soil's going, and we're degrading it at the same time if we're not just eroding it. So what happens, and, and this is to support you, John, just a little bit, and to say here's a picture of uh, of a chemical fertilized based corn crop right next to a cover crop sourced nitrogen, which is an organic kind of a system in a heavy, heavy rain year in Pennsylvania. And so the more organic biologically based system held on to its nitrogen. That corn stayed green down to the last leaf until the frost came. What happened to the nitrogen, same amount kind of, on the chemical based, but it went down the river. And so we create this eutrophication from agriculture, even though raised very conservatively I was, I was taught to take personal responsibility. One of the young men I trained that ended up in Congress said, as a good Republican, take personal responsibility. And I say, as agriculturalists, we should take personal responsibility. That's our nutrients that is killing the water and the oceans and the bays and the rivers, over 400 dead zones in the world. Ray's talking about uh, uh, erosion and loss of soil. It's everywhere. This is why we have 60 harvests left. It's in Templeton next to me by that farmer. This was a field next to the research I was doing with Howard Buffett in Africa. On the field next to my plots and my field demonstration sites, I asked the guys, bring the tractor in, and would you knock those weeds down? All those weed seeds are going to come into my field because it was right adjacent. They dissed it once. One rain event, I go, oh, shit. Look at what happened. Just one disking. There went the soil. Felt a little bad about that one. Anyway, when, when we look at my field, which was sandy soil, you would have called it a beach. And Howard Buffett used to say, Tim, I'm going to give you the best, worst soils you could find. Because if you can prove your organic, he would never use the term, your biological no-till system, then here's the bad soil. So I went in there, and a guy came, and he said, Tim, bring from your field a, a, a soil clod. And this is, this is Ray's uh, a slaking test. He says, I want to do a slaking test and show these people we're teaching today about your, your no-till system. And I thought, uh, I, I, I've heard about that, but this is sand. It's just not going to work. And he said, and then get one from the field next door that you dissed once. And, and the one on the right's a pasture-based system. So the one on the left was a field that dissed one time, and that's how fast it disaggregates. The one in the center were my fields, and I didn't even think I'd get it up to the main headquarters in my old truck that it would bounce apart. But look at the aggregation in sand from two years of no-till with a biological-based system where 
the mycorrhizae starting to exude the, the, its exudate, its glomalin, and gluing and holding that together. What an amazing thing. When the heavy rain event hit, you didn't see any erosion whatsoever, getting soil and biology and health back into that system. I don't have a pointer here, but I just want to say, I went at Rodale, and the, one of the reasons I was attracted to go there was, is I gave a seminar, I said, gee, the, I see these are the three most important things. If you guys agree, then let's talk. And one of the senior scientists said, well, we have some soil carbon data here that will really support what you're thinking about. And the one on the right was 2,300 uh, uh, kilograms of carbon, if you apply compost, that you could start to sequester in the soil. So that starts to address all four of those issues, hunger, water, soil loss, and climate, because we're taking it out of the atmosphere, putting it back. And we wrote a paper, Paul Hepperly and I did in 2008, positioning that we could sequester all of it. We could draw it all down. And of course, we took a lot of hits, but Al Gore listened, and some other people listened, and we got some attention by some people. But what I think is encouraging is, and I'll show you a slide later, because a later speaker this morning is going to talk about much more robust numbers, and compost is, there's not enough in the world to fix it. But Ray talked a little bit about multi-species covers crop, and Christine Jones, I asked her to share the slide with me. She's from Australia. We were in Paris recently, and she had shown one slide. I said, gee, can I have that? So the, it's the same field, but with a multi-species cover crop and a rain-fed system, look at the yield differences. So when soil gets covered with vegetation, when it gets covered with different root structures and different organisms that are being supported by the root structures in the soil, you end up not only not having a naked soil, a bare soil, and a soil with fever, but you're holding the moisture in the system, you're building the fertility in the system, and you're creating the nutrients because of the diversity that's happening. And, and tomorrow I'm having a little demonstration on my farm and I planted a summer cover crop, irrigated it up, and I find, boy, I don't even have to irrigate it much. Here in hot, dry California, it works so well. So David Johnson, who's speaking next, has summarized some of Gabe Brown's data that, that Ray's talked about with respect to how much sequestration can happen. But Gabe learned this over time, as I understand it, as he tried things, as he no-tilled, as he added cover crops, as we see that move across there. And when he moved to multi-species cover crop, we start to see an increase in soil carbon. And it wasn't until he brought the livestock in did that really jump and where he's getting 22 tons of carbon per hectare per year. Gee, that solves a lot of problems really, really fast for all of us on those four issues that I talk about. So what happens here is if we take that earlier graph that I shared with you, third from right is that compost level I was talking about. Boy, we could get 2,300 kilograms. There was a study out of the University of Georgia, and then Richard Teague at Texas A&M is doing great work on holistic management practices and sequestering carbon. But that Georgia showed about eight tons just when you started to mob graze in a, in a wet environment. And on those grasses, what an amazing level. David Johnson, who's here today, has started to show through biological enhanced agriculture, we can get much higher than that. We can solve this, but it takes a political will, it takes a consumer focus, it takes research at a university like Chico State that we're trying to invest in. It's a very unique model, I'd love to talk to you about that, with some leadership there that could make a difference. And it takes farmers, and we need people like Ray and we need people like David who can talk with those farmers. It's one of the reasons we need the term regenerative, not organic because you're, the door gets slammed in your face if you use that term with most farmers. We need to build bridges, not divides, and open this door and restore our environment as fast as we can. We can absolutely take us below 350. We can take us to pre-industrial levels. And I would at least posit for you to consider what the hell is 350 about? There is no history in our survival as a species on this planet where we've been at 350. We've been at 280. There's no evidence we can survive 350. And today we're at 400 plus. Our job is a very steep hill for us to climb. The beauty is nature, if we support the robustness of it and learn from what some of the luminaries in this audience can teach us, we can restore it all. But we have to get busy, and that means today. Thank you very much.
It's my honor and pleasure to introduce Greg Glendow, who's uh, the next speaker on this panel. He's from TerraGenesis, and they do global work as well from the standpoint of working with some of the companies that are leading in the regenerative thinking with regard to cropping systems and some of their important crops in cocoa and, and some of these uh, uh, unique and individually and importantly healthy foods, and working towards the perennial systems as well to try and establish perennial agriculture in, in an opportunity for obviously less tillage and an opportunity to build more resilient systems. With that, I'd like to introduce Greg. All right, everybody. Um, so, who here is a believer in soil as the great hope of humanity? Raise your hand. All right, awesome. So, we can just start from there and keep going, right? <clears throat> um, so, just a little bit about me. So, um, I work um, with farmers mostly in the global south personally. Um, the, the design group that I'm a part of works all over the world. And we really, um, we try to approach the problem holistically, um, n noticing, and, and one of the things that I've noticed and one of the things that I want to talk about with everybody is actually that it's e extraordinarily difficult to regenerate soil without regenerating the mind. Um, whether it's of the company that's purchasing an ingre ingredient or the consumer that's purchasing a product or of the farmer who's managing the agroecosystem that's producing that ingredient. Um, you know, all these great slides that we've seen, um, you know, just think of the metaphor of the soil as mind. So if we have minds that are fragmented by the tillage of our reductionist thinking, we're going to dissolve our, our capacity to hold steady and, and approach a goal as audacious and important as sequestering all atmospheric carbon that's been produced during the Industrial Revolution into biological sinks is going to be very hard because our will will just erode into the oceans of despair. Yeah? But if we can actually hold our minds together and our collective will together, then all of these things become remarkably um, possible all of a sudden. Right? Um, a, a great thinker once said, um, um, Bill Mollison, who's, who I would consider a um, a luminary in, in inviting us to think regeneratively said, you know, although the, the world's problems remain um, complex and challenging, the solutions are embarrassingly simple. Okay, one of the big simple, simple solutions here has to do with the ecology of our mind. Okay, you guys, you guys might be asking, what's this guy prattling on about? What, are, what, what exactly are you talking about? Well, for a moment, um, let's think about the, the work that needs to be done in order to understand um, the complexity of living systems. And Ray was speaking towards this, right? So what needs to happen? Um, if you ask a question, what's the fastest way to kill blight on corn, um, what kind of answer are you going to come up with to that question? Well, the soil may not be the fastest way to do that, actually. But if the question's different, if the question is something like, um, what are the conditions in which blight does not ever reach epidemic status in an ecosystem, then soil emerges, right? So I just want to propose that perhaps there's something about the way that we're currently operating as a society in which we're getting the right answers to the wrong questions. So, so what are the right questions? Does anybody have a, a you know, 
What's the right question to ask right now? We're all together. What's the right question? There are no right questions, but you know, give it a give it a crack. Yeah, so if I might, we might say what does what does an agricultural system look like that values farmers deeply as the basis of our entire civilization, right? Does civilization exist without agriculture? No, it doesn't, okay? And does agriculture exist without soil? No, it doesn't. Okay, so what, what does it look like when we deeply value farmers? Okay, I think that's a really good question. And I'd like to sort of um, speak to the, the idea that in order to answer that question, we're all going to have to be pretty courageous in, in applying the same sort of um, rigor and ability to actually um, look at what's really happening and not trust reductionist abstractions. Yeah, so that soil test. That's a brilliant, brilliant. So, so what happens when you go to a farmer and they're living in the Midwest and they're spraying chemicals and there's cancer in their family and they're eating TV dinners and they're you know, shopping at Walmart and all of these different things. And what happens when you go to someone who's um, a farmer and their kids are working with them on the farm and there's a whole bunch of different things going on. And what happens when we say, well, but um, if you're taking the reductionist mindset, the farmer, farmer A, exhibit A, um, there's much more financial capital flowing through that system. So therefore, it must be uh, superior. And exhibit B, there's hardly any financial capital flowing there. So, 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 what are the fundamental questions that we need to ask in order to move the conversation forward? That's a good one. But what does food waste have to do with soil health? So, in a, in a system, so, so just to, in a, in a natural system, if, if you're in the Amazon jungle and you see a, a flock of scarlet macaws coming, what are they doing? They're eating like five or 10% of every seed and the rest is dropping. Is that waste? Right, they're providing a key ecological service for every other animal that comes and cleans it up and it, you know, and some of them fall and they sprout and all of these different things happen. So. <clears throat> So I guess I would ask, how do we connect waste back into the whole system, right? So if the question is, how do we reduce food waste? I think we go off on a tangent because we're trying to get the right answer to the very simple question. It's like, how do you fix blight? How do you fix this, this one thing? You know, instead, I want to propose that if we start getting in the habit of asking, how do we link this particular asset aspect of the whole, of the whole system that we notice is out of balance back to the whole, to the whole system in a, in a powerful way, we'll start to get very interesting answers. So what does wastage, how does wastage look in a system where we're actively cultivating the health of the soil and we're looking to increase the amount of um, economic gains that are in the hands of the people who are stewarding our, our agriculture system. Anybody have a, you know, overpower the bad with the good. Yeah, so there's something here that I've been sort of dancing around, probably not very elegantly, which has to do with, you know, regenerative agriculture and regenerative economics are completely connected. You can't have one without the other. And, and that weaves back to, to policy. And that weaves back to governance. So, so I recently, I was sitting back at the table with Rosie and she said something that um, really sat with me, it really sunk in, which is, you know, this is gonna take all of us 
doing many different things. And one of the things that we got to overcome is the illusion of separation between someone who's doing policy work in Washington, D.C., towards agrarian reform or shifting subs subsidies away from you know, chemical agriculture and somebody who's working to, to you know, revolutionize um, broad acre annual agriculture into a no-till revolution. Those people are on the same team. We're all on the same team. So um, one of the things that I've really been, been sitting with recently is, is what does it look like to have rigorous, deep, powerful disagreements because you want to serve the same thing. So what does it look like for us to be able to say to one another, I actually disagree with you, but it's because I love the same thing as you. It's because I love the soil. It's because I love, I love the, the image of a world in which humans are serving the health of the biosphere. What does it look like for humans to... Um, for, for us as a society, as a group, as a movement, to, to deeply um, embody and explore what it looks like to have both heated agreement and heated disagreement in service to one another in a whole. So I think that's really where, I, you know, I've got plenty of other things to say, but that's really what I want to kind of leave the conference with you know, leave all of us to take out into, there's, there's other plenaries, there's working groups, there's all these other things. What does it look like when you hear something and somebody says, you know, like Ray talked about, he, he, was, he was narrating what it, what it was like for him to talk to farmers and he referred to Walmart. Okay, or, or you know, sometimes we're gonna work with people who are doing GMO things because we want to improve the system. What does it look like to deeply hold to your value system and not say, wow, that's completely right and I'm just gonna like, let it go, but to deeply say, huh, I wonder what's happening here and I wonder how I could communicate um, what feels important to me and also listen to what's important to them because I'm deeply committed to serving the same aim which is what? Sequestering all of the atmospheric carbon that's been accumulated over the Industrial Revolution into biological sources so that we can increase the abundance and health that's the basis of our very existence as humans. So thank you all very much. Thank you all. It will. It will take the political will. It will take the education. It will take the science. It will take the consumer focus. It takes a village. All of us working together. I invite all of you to go onto your social media platforms to help us amplify this message. We are live streaming Soil Not Oil on the website and on Facebook, so you can find it there. Please share using at Soil Not Oil, and our hashtag is Soil Not Oil 2017. So if you're picking up small tidbits and facts, these are the tools and the platforms that we can utilize because we're privileged to be sitting here learning this information and blast it out to millions and millions more. Now, we have our second plenary coming up, and I have the great honor of introducing Diana Donlin, who works for the Center for Food Safety. Who has seen some of their soil solutions videos? They're fantastic. They're available in multiple languages, so I encourage you to log on, to watch them, to share them. It puts this information in very easy to understand terms and she will now be leading a panel talking about different solutions to regenerative agriculture by drawing down carbon at the landscape level. So Diana, the stage is yours. Round of applause for Diana. Thanks, Aaron. Good morning. Um, is this working? Okay. So the, plan, uh, the plenary that we're going to have now um, is really focused on building this idea of solutions and hope. And uh, we have David Johnson here with us from New Mexico, and he's a molecular 
biologist at the University of New Mexico, Las Cruces, and I had the great honor of meeting David in Hawaii last year because um, Center for Food Safety does have a small office in Hawaii and was approached by farmers and ranchers um, in the islands and asked to please bring some people together to talk about soil health. So we brought David to speak to these ranchers and m many of them were conventional. Um, and by the end of the weekend, he had totally convinced them that this was the way to make their systems more resilient and more profitable. And as a result, because Hawaii's a pretty small uh, island state and very nimble, um, working with our policy team, we were able to introduce policy to start a carbon farming task force that is now up and running in Hawaii. So that's the power of David Johnson, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Diana. Appreciate it. So, John, it must be but Mr. Fuller Day. <laughs> you never change things by fighting the existing reality. You change something by building a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. What I hope to convey to you here today is Okay. What I hope to convey to you today is a, the potential ability to fulfill this. This is another tool in the toolbox that will help us get to the root of the matter. First of all, you have to look at the system that you're dealing with. This is what we see on planet Earth today. There are ladders of succession for all of the different ecosystems moving down here from barrel soil parent material to your conifers and your old growth forest. What you see as you progress through there is an increase in net primary productivity. You also see a change from a bacterial dominant to a fungal dominant soil. This is where we are in agriculture today. What we grow well are weeds. This is where we need to be. Now what we have to realize about agriculture is its controlled disturbance, not controlled demolition. So how do we get here? What we're trying to do is mimic what's happening in the rangeland soils, as Ray was talking about, bringing in the cattle. And what they do to this system is they start to improve the fertility, but they improve it by changing the, the structure of the microbes in the soil from a bacterial dominant to a fungal dominant soil. So we have to mimic that process in agriculture. This all came out of research that I was doing with USDA about find a way to make dairy waste a good product. Everybody that had tried it before ended up with a very saline product and it was bad. They concluded that it was bad for soils. My wife and I developed a composting process, a static composting process that used worms, vermicomposting, that gave a very fungal dominant compost. It also reduced water usage in the composting process by six times, reduced composting time by about 66 percent, and it also reduced the salinity in that dairy manure. This is the first week analysis of the, the bacteria in that system. As you can see, the top 80 percent only had about 23 species. There's not a lot of diversity in this, and there's a lot of high percentage population bacteria. This is at week four. Again, the top 80% only had about 23 species. This is week 22 and people say compost is ready to use. So you can see still only 57 species in the top 87%. This is 60 weeks. You can see you now have 99 species of bacteria in this. You have increased the diversity of this system, and you've also smoothed out uh, the population structure. I used this compost in a test to look at the different soil conditions that we see in agriculture from, oops, 
from a bacterial dominant, low carbon soils, that's what we're dealing with in agriculture today, up to a fungal dominant, high carbon soil, as which is the goal that we're looking for. When you look at the efficiency of carbon flow through these different uh, soil conditions, you see in a bacterial dominant soil, only 3% of the carbon that you've captured actually goes into the plant structure. As you move up, fungal to bacterial ratio 0.84, you get 17%. Fungal to bacterial ratio 1.6, 21%. That fungal to bacterial ratio 2.3, you have 30%. Up to 37 on the next, and 56% in a fungal dominant fertile soil. This is where we are in our conventional agricultural system. We run at about 10% efficiency. We have the ability to quintuple that. So does this work in the real world? First of all, just a little primer on uh, the net primary production that most of the systems on this plant put out. In the best case scenario, a tropical rainforest does about 2,200 grams of dry biomass per square meter. Cultivated land, 600%. We water it, we irrigate it, we weed it, and still we're only netting about 600 grams of dry biomass. What I'm promoting is a biologically enhanced agricultural management, where we start to put the microbes back into this system and let them function, because microbes are the backbone of every organism and every ecosystem on this planet. In advanced beam, we've been practicing it for, for two or th for four or five years, I'm seeing up to 3,000 grams of dry biomass per square meter production. To do this in the real world, I do inoculations with the compost. This is what I started out with. This is 400 pounds per acre compost uh, application to kind of give you a visual of how little it takes to do this. This is a desert sandy soil test that I did. Uh, one application of compost the first year, growing cover crops, cutting them, hauling them off, growing again, cutting, hauling them off. This, the first year we did about 800 grams of dry biomass per square meter. This is the second year, 1,608. We doubled the production in that second year. This is the third year, 2,190 grams of dry biomass. Now, Consider this is a winter cover crop. Sorry to use the word cover crop, Ray. <laughs> you can see we're doing as much net primary productivity as the most productive ecosystem in the world in 10 weeks of growth. You plant this in about November, but it doesn't start really growing in February, and this would be at the end of uh, April. So that much production with the right biology can make a big difference in our agroecosystems today. This is what it looked like over the three years. 820 on the treated, 1506, 2191, and 2244 in this last year. The system itself, the treated was doing 3,000 grams or above of dry biomass per square meter per year. A control with no treatment, you can see, was doing about 2,200. If you extend the trend lines on those, for the control to catch up with the treated, it's about a 30-year window. So biology does make a difference in this. This is looking at the soil in that system, comparing what I started with in the desert soil to the control treatment where we just planted cover crops and hauled them off to one that we treated with biology. You can see the diversity from that one treatment changes the whole way the system works. So we see significant increases in net primary production. Did this in another field at a university research site. Had one year of beam application, a control here. We had five times increase in the net primary productivity in one year. This is year six, 881 grams of dry biomass per square meter on that field, capturing 264 pounds of nitrogen just in the above ground biomass. This is uh, the summer cover crop. It's uh, sunflower, sesbania, 
uh, another couple of millets in it. And at June 23rd, it was about four inches high. 29 days later, it was six foot high. 17 days later, it was over seven foot high. Now consider, this is a black oil seed sunflower. It's only supposed to grow about four to five feet tall. The heads are only supposed to be about six inches. As you can see the heads, some of them were bigger than mine. So we don't know what these plants can do when they are grown in the right condition. On the left-hand side is Cespania. The first season we grew it, it was four feet tall. The second season we grew it, it was six feet tall. And then this last season, it was 12 foot tall. So again, these plants act different with the right biology in the soil. This is this year's cover crop out there, 1,141 grams of dry biomass per square meter. Now realize we've gone from 50 to 1,141 grams in six years. So the dynamics change as the biology changes. This system also increases micronutrient availability, which a lot of the problem we have in our foods today is nutrient density. We do not have all the elements in there that we need for our survival on this planet. In the first 20 months of applying beam, I did five sampling periods. We saw, oops, we saw increases of over 1,100% on both manganese and iron as far as soluble elements that were available to the plant. We saw changes in magnesium, calcium, zinc, and copper from 83% to 40. We saw net macronutrient increases from 107% to 37% for N, P, and K. Now realize we use no fertilizers. I've used no fertilizers on this for the past seven years. And yet the biology starts to bring these new micronutrients and macronutrients back to availability. It increases water storage also. The first 1% increase in soil carbon quintuples the water that you have to work with in that system. That allows that water to stay around longer so you can use it more efficiently for photosynthesis, for all the processes that go on in the soil. We have nothing to lose by increasing carbon in the soil. It also increases soil carbon use of efficiency. This is kind of important because most scientists are saying if we increase carbon in the soil, we're just going to increase respiration. And to a certain point, they're true. This is true, but when you take a little deeper look at it, as you change your fungal bacterial ratio and increase your fertility in that system, now there's a hundred times increase in the biological biomass in this range of soils. And yet, we have an 18 times increase in the beginning soil carbon mass but only a four times increase in the soil carbon respiration. So what we've done, changing the biology changes the carbon use efficiency in the system. You look at this a little different way, at your relative soil respiration, relative to this amount of carbon that you had in that soil to start with. In a bacterial dominant, low carbon soil, 44% of that carbon is respired. As you increase the fertility, only 11% of the original carbon in that soil is respired. And that's how we're able to store more carbon, and that's how we'll reduce atmospheric CO2 concentrations by using agroecosystems. Increases carbon capture in the soils through the, both growing more biomass and improving carbon use efficiency. And this is what we've observed over the last four and a half years. An increase of 10.7 metric tons of carbon per hectare a year that we put into the soils or a quarter of a percent increase in the soil carbon each year in the top foot. When you compare this to other studies, West has 67 long-term no-till studies. 0.57 is what he's seen as potential increase as far as getting carbon into the soil. And this is tons of carbon per hectare per year. Nigley, 0.2. Lowell is 0.7. The first four and a half years, I've averaged 10.7 tons carbon per hectare per year. I see the potential at 19.2. When you look at these systems for capturing carbon, if we do this scenario, it would take 40% of the arable land area on this planet to capture all anthropogenic CO2. If you, 
if you go into an improved system, I see the potential for 19.2 tons. That would require 25% of the arable land on this planet. Now, I felt a little fringe for a while until Gabe, I finally got his data and I put it uh, on the chart. And he's doing a half percent. Back here, oops. I, I'm projecting half a percent potential. Gabe's doing it. So, and the change that happened on this is when he hit 3% solar organic matter, his carbon is important in this equation. When he stopped using nitrogen fertilizers, that's when this system took off. So we're also improving crop yields in this. This is a cotton crop that we do one and a half years beam compared to 150 pounds of nitrogen conventional. We've been able to increase the production in cotton and chili in uh, small trials, 114% for cotton, 98% for chili. This is my cotton crop this year. Uh, that was July 17th, two weeks later. Four weeks later, this is what we call high cotton. <laughs> and if you're picking cotton, that's the cotton you want to pick it in, because you don't have to bend over. <laughs> but the bowl formation on there is pretty significant. It's maturing very good. I'll have to see what the crop is, but we did five bales on that other treatment before. So we can meet these challenges. We can produce more food, reclaim, reclaim the degraded soils, and increase land area. We can use less water by increasing both plant water use efficiency and soil water hold capacity. We can reduce energy use by allowing nature to extract or fix the essential nutrients, and we re reduce both agrochemical pollution and atmospheric CO2 concentrations at the same time. Why should we pursue this? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, you give that to her. Yeah, right. Does he want to make the announcement? Where's the announcement? We have a quick announcement. Quick announcement in Castilla. Eh, ¿Hay alguna persona que necesite interpretación al español o castellano o como le quieran llamar? Levante la mano, no? Okay, we're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think I promised you at the beginning of this session that we would see some hope and I think David Johnson really his studies are outstanding and I think he does provide us with much needed hope um, and, and great practicality so thank you David. Um, our next speaker is Brittany Cole Bush who is a modern-day shepherdess and she manages upwards of 2,000 um, animals at a time sheep and goats um, I first met Brittany in Bolinas and was just so impressed by her vision um, of making shepherding a viable career for young people. And I think this speaks a little bit to what Greg was talking about, about changing our thinking and opening it up. Because certainly when I was younger, um, I don't think I ever thought about being a shepherdess ever. <laughs> um, and I don't think it would have been very viable, but she's making it viable. And she just had a big adventure in France and Spain, um, going to the Pyrenees to learn about how they actually uh, train shepherds and shepherdesses to manage very large landscapes and uh, control fire and so forth. So, Brittany Cole Bush. Thank you so much. It's an honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm holding my Bible right now. A lot of people have are familiar with the word shepherd or shepherdess in the biblical biblical terms I think I think Jesus was a shepherd so um, I'm I, I'm glad to come here as a modern day shepherdess uh, like Daniela uh, excuse me Diana said um, I am a self-deemed modern day shepherdess uh, 
and I call myself this because I've been a part of bringing livestock to the urban peripheries all over the Bay Area, and now I'm working to get it down in uh, Southern California. Um, one of the uh, one of the biggest reasons we do that uh, we bring livestock down or in the urban spaces is fire hazard reduction. In fact, LA had its largest fire on record uh, in the. Uh, city boundaries last week. So I'll get a little bit more into um, the importance of how managed grazing of livestock can be an incredibly important piece in public safety as long as other, as well as other ecological tools. All right, I'm gonna put my Bible down real quick. All right. So here's an example of some of the work that I've been a part of. Um, like I said, I bring sheep and goats. Uh, I work with large uh, commercial operators with sh of sheep and goats, and we work to bring livestock to urban peripheries. Here is a homeowners association uh, in, I believe, I think this might have been Fremont area. So here's another example of livestock on the urban periphery. So how many of you out there have had the sense or notion that livestock are bad? Okay, great. We'll get into, we'll get into why livestock aren't bad, but how it's the management of livestock that can create either positive benefits to our ecologies or negative. And so I hope by the end of this, you have some, uh, you have some more love for livestock. <laughs> All right, like I said, there's a plethora of ecological benefits when we manage livestock in very, very carefully uh, ways, and I'll get into that as well. Uh, effective and timely fuels reduction. Like I said, LA had its largest fire uh, to date last week. Uh, in, in the late 80s, uh, some of you will remember the, the tremendous fires in the East Bay and what devastation it created. The East Bay Regional Parks District started utilizing large herds of sheep and goats to reduce vegetation around infrastructure of the city perimeters uh, in a very timely way. What's the alternative to uh, this method? The dependency of fossil fuel mechanical tools and lots and lots and lots of human labor. Think about 24-hour uh, workers who uh, just work for food. Here's an example. Invasive species management, job creation, and the agricultural sector support. Um, I'm really excited about the job creation piece because there is a next generation of individuals who do not necessarily want to be inside in front of computers that want to engage with their environments. And so I am very grateful to say that I'm a part of a larger community of new grazers uh, working to create new types of livelihoods that are uh, beneficial to our lands and our communities. And community engagement and public education I've met a lot of people from the city who don't even know the difference between a sheep and a goat. So when we see sheep and goats in public, in public parks, um, we can start you know, educating youth from inner city situations who've never had that interaction with livestock. And livestock definitely have different uh, behaviors when it's just one or two that you might see at the fair in a herd just like us, together we can have incredible impact. And the same thing with animals. And so I would like to um, kind of invite that idea is that we're actually all part of the same herd. And now we just have to be managed in such a way. <laughs> we have to do some human herding to encourage all of the, the positive benefits um, that I've been speaking of. All right, so here's an example of a fuel break uh, created by sheep and goats. They did this in two days, or excuse me, two acres in one day. And there are homes all up on the top of that ridge. And these animals carefully managed with electric fence lines, border collies, and uh, skilled herders uh, were able to accomplish this. Here's the invasive species uh, example, excuse me. This is another example of large herds in the urban periphery. And look at that guy. That guy was a runner. 
Can you imagine what the heck that guy was feeling? I told him, just stay put, you'll be okay. I was like yelling, I'm like, just stay put. And these guys uh, ran up and, around him and it was not a thing. It's pretty exciting to do this type of work. Uh, that right there, that's a mixed herd, uh, we call that a flirt, of sheep and goats of about, there's about 700 there. Here's uh, some more examples. And, you know, I'm an advocate for sheep and goats because I'm small and cows scare me. I love cows, though. They do great things. Uh, but um, what I'll show you most of are, are uh, examples of sheep and goats. Um, they have different impact than cattle do, of course, because of their mass. But cattle are a great, great tool for positive benefit using animal impact. So livestock aren't inherently bad. It's about their management. And that takes a lot of education and experience more than anything to learn the, the, how management is so crucial in making sure that the livestock are in the right place at the right time for the right reasons. Also, understanding how the land vegetation needs to rest to grow back to stave away from overgrazing. Um, understanding ecosystem processes as a grazer is tremendously important because we're managing livestock for not just the purpose of reducing vegetation for fire, of course. We're here because we're talking about soil, and livestock can be in a tremendous tool increase, increasing soil organic matter. So we have to understand ecosystem processes as grazers. Here's an example, same landscape, same landscape, different management. So you can see that it, it truly is management of how these animals are run through to create different impacts on the landscape. So here's the ecosystem processes that uh, myself and grazers think about and work to understand when we're managing our livestock. So here again are some of the positive impacts through managed grazing with livestock. We can improve soil health. We can sequester carbon, which is an interesting piece that we'll bring back Two, uh, water retention and forage productivity. And again, as David uh, had pointed out earlier with a tremendous amount of data, which I very much so um, value, uh, is that as we increase soil organic matter, we're able to do tremendous things like water retention and, as we saw, incredible uh, forage productivity. So when we talk about grasslands and soil and the relationship of grazing animals on this, it's, it, it's very impactful. One billion people depend on grasslands for their livelihoods, mostly through livestock production for food and fiber. So this is, we cannot, we cannot uh, turn our heads away from what livestock are to this bigger story. I would say, the grasslands can be considered the seas of our land. And of course, we are a water uh, planet, um, like we heard earlier from John. But I believe that grasslands can be considered the sea of our landscapes. So, so the IPCC estimates that 9 billion tons of carbon is held in these grassland veg uh, the grassland vegetation, while 295 billion tons is stored in grassland soil. So I'm into grass, but it's really, it's really that whole dynamic that this vegetation has with the soil that is what we're very much so passionate about because this is our solution. Uh, so my, another one of my, uh, my Bibles is the Drawdown uh, book by Paul Hawkins, uh, but also the Carbon Farming Solution does, uh, who, who's familiar with this one? This one's a real good one. Okay, all right. So, so, so this might be familiar stuff. So science is a really important piece in this. Um, a lot of, there's a tremendous amount of reasons why. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit um, about the dynamic between science and research 
uh, and the wisdom of the practitioner, which I believe is really important. But I'm going to focus here on the science a little bit. Um, there is, a, uh, let's see, for those of you, excuse me, for those of you familiar with that work of uh, the carbon farming solution, uh, there is a tremendous amount of work looking at um, uh, all of the data points of how how grazing as, is a part of the this, this soil story. Um, because of the variability, there's so many conditions to take into uh, consideration in, in this research. There is a lot of contention in the scientific community and those on the ground, because those on the ground, based on their management, have been able to see tremendous, tremendous impacts based on how they're moving their animals about their landscapes. Uh, for scientists, it's, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to conduct this type of research with these very varying conditions, especially when animals are involved. So uh, this, scienti uh, this scientific research is really important. Um, in Drawdown, Paul talks about um, Andre Voisin. He was a farmer and uh, I think he was a farmer and a plant scientist uh, from 1957 in France. And he studied these two variables, how long those animals were in there and the resting time uh, in between those two. Oopsies. He found his estimations were one half to three tons of carbon per acre can be sequestered um, based on improved grazing methods, but we also have to take into consideration methane and uh, nitrous oxide emissions. Again, with that in mind and taking that out of the consideration of the one half to three tons, because 70% of the world's ag lands uh, can be uh, grazed, there can be significant impact. Uh, Gay Brown was already mentioned. Uh, Will Harris reports his uh, 1,250 acres of carbon-rich organic matter is 10 times of that of the conventional farms nearby with the same soil type and rainfall. Great, thank you. All right, I'm going to uh, blast through this a little bit because I wanted to get to my shepherding school experience. Again, science important married with the wisdom and experience of the manager. So I went to Spain and France with my friend Guido uh, Francini of True Grass Farms of Valley Ford, California, and we went to learn to see how the next generation of shepherds, of grazers, are being trained in Spain and France. It's huge. And a lot of these uh, shepherds and sh uh, grazers of cows, sheep, and goats, uh, they're coming from the urban centers. So we're just like scratching our heads, okay, how can we, how can we learn from these folks out there to, to translate that to a Western United States context? So we went out there through the support of Fibershed, a fantastic organization, organization, excuse me, that many of you are most likely familiar with. And we learned this guy has been up on this mountain in the Alps of France as a salaried shepherd for the last 40 years. And he shared with me his stories and his experience, both on ecological impact, but then also in cultural impact of uh, his, his work in shepherding. So we're training a new, um, they're training a new generation of grazers out there. And what I've kind of deemed this process uh, in context of us out here is new pastoralism. Uh, this was a part of our adventure. We traveled in a van uh, for a month through Spain and France, got to see incredible landscapes. This is a, a, a young woman from the city who is now training in one of those schools in Catalonia. As you can see, women are a very big part of this. And I, again, John mentioned how women and children uh, are a very, if not the most important uh, kind of people out there in, in making this uh, change happen. So uh, proliferation of female shepherds uh, is certainly true. And I wanna respect your time, so I'll, I'll kind of move through. Very passionate shepherd right there. <laughs> he, was, he was a hoot. 
So I'm showing you a lot of French sheep. These are salaried French shepherds, and we got to shadow them on their daily circuits. Notice no fences. This was a Basque family that were cheese producers. So how can we translate that into the urban context I was just mentioning? I've been thinking, who could, who could be a new demographic of non-traditional agrarians that could impact our urban areas? So globally, we're seeing folks move to urban areas, right? Well, the urban areas have open space peripheries. Who can we have? How, who can we think about being trained as these new shepherds or ecological doctors, as my friend Fred Preventa likes to call us? California Conservation Corps, uh, previously uh, incarcerated individuals, refugees and immigrant groups, and urban core uh, inner city youth at risk. All of these folks, all of these folks, have, thank you, have the potential to be trained to manage livestock in a very carefully way. Of course, there's a lot of training involved in that. To protect our urban peripheries from fire, but then also be a part of, uh, of all of the ecological benefits, including perhaps restoring some very, very sick and denuded uh, landscapes. So I, um, while I want to invite you to give me uh, more ideas on communities and groups that could potentially be trained here in the Western United States to become modern day urban shepherds and shepherdesses and grazers. Uh, and I'm going to be giving a free webinar to uh, give the summary of what my findings are and then also to begin to bring recommendations of what a grazing school um, very similar uh, from the schools that I visited in Spain and France, uh, how that could proliferate uh, a new, a new uh, demographic, a new community of these types of folks on the land. So thank you very much for your time. Sorry for taking your time. Thank you, Brittany. Isn't that exciting? Um, David has one little thing he would like to add that he forgot to mention during his presentation. Just really quick to the practicality of the application of the compost on our uh, farming soils. In Australia, they're now doing something very similar to this with, let me emphasize, the right compost. And they're applying it at one kilogram per hectare and getting good results. Just wanted to leave that with you as far as the practicality of this system. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Um, I think we need a little stretch break. So just quickly, if everyone wants to stretch, I have a very short presentation that covers um, kind of big picture opportunity. And then we will have our breakouts. Um, Great. So I'm going to start going while you're still stretching, um, but I guess I need the clicker. How does it work? So we have been hearing a lot this morning about um, some specific, specific opportunities, and I wanted to just go back for a minute to uh, the larger climate movement and interacting with people who are not uh, up to speed on the soil carbon opportunity. And I think most people are familiar with uh, Charles Keeling's famous curve, which came out in the late 1950s, and which first identified the problem of atmospheric carbon going up so much. But it also, and I think that this is really interesting, um, it also identifies the solution right here. And that is, as we've been sort of trained to look, we, we know that this upward curve um, is now at 400 parts per million. You see these red squiggly lines. And those red squiggly lines are what are called 
the interannual fluctuations. And those happen every year without fail when the northern forests of this planet leaf out. And so what happens is in the spring, in the northern latitudes, all of a sudden parts per million drop by an average of five to six parts per million CO2. Um, so there's nature's drawdown right there for us um, because we know that this process or this technology or whatever you want to call it that actually removes CO2 from the atmosphere um, is photosynthesis. And I just wanted to talk about the opportunity a little bit because if you consider that this is happening every year despite the fact that we have stripped away 50% of the tree cover on this planet. Um, a study came out last year that, came, that aggregated all the information and found, and you can see it right here on this map of the world, um, where we are lacking vegetation. So if you look at it from the flip side, this is an opportunity, right? Because we could greatly increase photosynthetic activity and therefore the atmospheric drawdown that we so desperately need. Um, as Brittany was saying, grasslands cover 40% of the Earth's surface. So they, in addition to forests, are also a, present a tremendous opportunity for regeneration, but it is a question of managing them properly. And uh, I think that so often when we talk about climate and we like to take the blame away from human actors and put it on the animals and make it seem like somehow the animals are inherently problematic, but it's the way that we manage these uh, domesticated animals that can be either a force for regeneration or for um, resource depletion. So um, we know what we need to do. Uh, John Liu, who I think was also mentioned earlier, a friend of ours who's in, based out of Beijing, um, says that the principles that are required are biodiversity, uh, so in the compost, the, the, the biologically enhanced compost with the most microbes is the most productive. Um, we need increased biomass, particularly in the tropics where um, things grow very quickly. And we need that accumulated um, organic matter on the soil surface. Um, so we are able to act as individuals, but we're also able to act as networks. And it's been really inspiring to me as somebody um, who's been involved with this conference for the last three years to see how quickly the whole movement is starting to scale. And I'm just giving a very couple of very um, quick examples of some networks that are in place. Um, there's certainly many others that I've overlooked here, but I just wanted to give you a thumbnail sketch. So working on grasslands, the Savory Network is global. Um, working here in the Bay Area, the Marin Carbon Project is working at scale with uh, compost application. Um, the little logo of the orange leaf and the blue leaf is a project of ecosystem restoration camps that started this year in a very degraded landscape in southern Spain. And the vision for that is to have a network of these eco camps all over the world, kind of like woofing, where people can come and stay and uh, volunteer their expertise. Um, and help regenerate degraded landscapes. Um, so the one in Spain has a Facebook page. It's up and running. It's amazing what they've been able to do just since June when they started. They already have a harvest. And you wouldn't think that this land would grow anything, not even a weed. Um, oh, ecosystem restoration camps. Um, it's this guy, John Liu's vision. Um, and the, the, so just ecosystem restoration camps on Facebook. Um, there also, there's a page about them on our Soil Solution website. Uh, we'll direct you to them as well. Um, Ecosia is a, a web browser 
that since it started has planted 13 million trees. They have tree nurseries all over the world. You can switch your browser to Ecosia and every time you search something, they will plant a tree. And it's really fun to see, you know, when you log on to see how many trees. I've been using it maybe four months and I've planted, I've planted um, about a thousand trees. So that's, that's uh, some, a daily thing you can do if you can't give up time and, and go to an eco camp or something. Um, Brittany mentioned Fiber Shed. They are working to regenerate um, local economies based on opportunities with uh, fiber, and it's a very integrated model that work, works with farmers and producers and ranchers and um, is really sort of kickstarting some depressed regions. Um, so I encourage you to look them up. And then Agenda Goch is something in the Atlantic rainforest in Brazil where um, they've been able to regenerate just, it's unbelievable. If you Google a video called Life in Syntropy and you see what was completely deforested um, now has running streams, tall trees, um, animals, and it's a very um, intensive pruning method that encourages plant growth and then the understory, the, the litter is left to regenerate the soil. So these are just some examples of networks that you can plug into, um, but I encourage everybody to take individual and collective action to join our organizations and um, to support us if possible. So thank you very much for um, this opportunity and we now have a break but I just want to have one last round of applause for our speakers.